distant fashion have come to love your congregation. And I truly love your singing. Turning now to God's word, would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And in that chapter, we want to start reading at verse 32. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and the chains of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Astounding, eh? That they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our text coming this morning from verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Dear friends and fellow Christians, every Christian on planet Earth has ever had to deal with the culture in which they live. You also are dealing with a certain culture. And what it would appear that our culture has sports fever like never before. There are some people so enthralled by sports, they can scarcely think of anything else. And let's be honest, if you're sports inclined and you're physically fit and at the top of your game, what a joy it is what a joy it is to be the hero in a sports contest. If you're playing football and there's 22 guys out there in the field banging each other up, and then you intercept a pass at the two-yard line, dodge all those colliding bodies for 98 
yard run for a touchdown. Oh, how the crowd goes wild. Or if you're into basketball and your team is about to lose by a fraction and split second before the end, you take a long shot from three-quarter court and I've witnessed it with my own eyes. And the buzzer goes while the ball is in the air and it swishes through the basket. Oh, what a joy and how the crowd goes crazy. And so our society is involved in it. However, this text is not set against the context of American sports. Instead, to be honest, it is set against the context of Roman sports. At the time that this is written, and scholars believe that it was written probably one or two, maybe three years prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, God's perfect timing for the destruction of that Old Testament system and for fueling the Christian endeavor. But at that time, Rome was at the height of her power. Her armies were conquering absolutely everywhere. And wherever those armies went, right on the heels of that went all those Roman engineers. And they were building, building, building roads and complexes and everything they could imagine. And behind that came the Roman lawyers and the scribes, and they were setting up the Roman tax system and the Roman rule of law. And along with that, especially out of the mouths of some Caesars, came the instructions that they were supposed to build sports arenas, stadiums, gymnasiums. And you even know that in Rome, at the height of her power, was this monstrous Colosseum part of which is still standing. With that monstrous Colosseum, it could house, hold 87,000 spectators. Bleachers all the way around. Balconies, three of them, all the way around. So all the way up, they could fill that place for the sports and Rome was progressing with her love for sports. Our culture is also progressing with her love for sports. They went from foot races to horse races to something a little bit more engaging, boxing and wrestling, to animal fights between humans and animals, to gladiators fighting to the death, to even that got tame for some Caesars, putting Christians to the lions. Against that context is this text. Therefore, seeing we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, oh, but... The Roman gladiators had a special little custom, we are told according to the historians. That when the gladiators were about to fight, they would come out and meet in the center of the arena. And they would have this little ceremony as they would turn and face the booth where the governor sat, or better yet, where Caesar sat. And they would face him and give him this specialized greeting before the fight began. Because whoever won would be able to go up to that booth and receive the crown of the victor. Can you imagine what a joy it must have been for that gladiator to win? and to stand over his opponent with a sword tipped to his neck and wait for the cue 
from the governor, whether the thumb be up or the thumb down. Can you imagine the horror of being there on the floor of that stadium, looking up to see whether the thumb went up or down, whether he would live or die? Can you imagine Christians in the middle of that arena? When the gates would come open and they would be huddled in the middle of the arena, praying desperate prayers as the lions drooling, tails twitching, would come toward the center. And then under that situation, never, 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 even if there was a Christian on the top row, the top balcony, that Christian would never have dared to call out encouragement to those in the middle of the arena to say, Go, Christian! That one would have never dared. However, you are not in ancient Rome. You are here in modern America, 2023. And now it's your turn. For you also are in the center of the arena. Whether you pay attention to it or not, and you are being watched, and you're in a contest. And the Lord speaks to you through this text this morning. For you are being watched, and you are in the contest. That text, how does it read? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Point one, you're being watched. By whom? A cloud of witnesses. I loved it during the congregational prayer this morning. Well, Pastor Noble, instinctively, of course, is not knowing that, tied together our worship here with the heavenly worship around about the throne of God. Go back to the text. It says, Therefore we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The Hebrew, the Greek word for surrounded, is an easy word, and I can explain it to you. It is peri kimonon. Peri, around, Kimonon in the center. You are peri Kimonon. Surrounded by whom? By such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, personal confession to all you boys and girls, I want to say it too. When you read the Bible, please know, boys and girls, teenagers, there are no mistakes there. Even if you read it wrong, it's still there correctly. I confess that all the way through my college years, all my through high school years, college years, seminary years, and the first five years of seminary, confession, I read this text wrong. I read it as crowd of witnesses. Not so. It's cloud. What does that involve? That involves two concepts at once. Yes, you are surrounded by an enormous crowd of witnesses, but it also being the very crowd is elevated like a cloud way up in the bleachers of heaven. What is this referring to? Well, chapter 12 is right on the basis of... Chapter 11. And chapter 11 is speaking about all these heroes of faith. And you can just run through the list. Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Rahab. Rahab? Yeah, she too. Samuel, David, and all the prophets. And they are surrounding you. What? 
they are watching? Are they? Are they watching? You know, of course, that they give a witness, and the witness is revealed in the pages of Scripture as they're talking to you via the pages of Scripture, even as the quote from Psalm 22 refers to a psalm that was written 3,000 years ago. Nonetheless, there's beautiful promises from God's Word encouraging you in your journey from those pages of Scripture. But these saints in glory are referred to here as a cloud of witnesses. Is it true? Is it true that the heavenly realm is aware of everything that's going on in the earthly realm? Is it true that those who have come through the battle and have joined the church triumphant are still concerned about those involved in the church militant? Is it true that the details of your life are all watched over from those who watch from heaven? Yes, you know. You know that God the Heavenly Father sitting on His throne watches absolutely every detail. You know that from Scripture that not a bird can fall from the sky without his will. You know from Scripture that not a hair can fall from your head without his will. You know then by implications, not a cell in your body can turn cancerous without his will. Mind you, you've got a hundred billion cells in the tip of your finger. You know as well that not a thought can appear in your head without His will. And you know as well that not a heartbeat can occur in your chest without His will. So He's got all that taken care of. You know as well that from heaven's perspective, the Lord Jesus on the throne of glory looks down And he's watching absolutely intimately for absolutely everything. And what does the Bible say he's doing right now? Acts 14, Acts 17, Romans 8. He is interceding for you hour after hour, moment after moment, second by second. He is interceding for you lest your faith fail. And you know from Scripture that those who are translated to church triumphant don't cease to care about church militant. You got that proof in Scripture, Revelation 6. The souls beneath the altar, never mind they're in paradise and they're in a wonderful place, the souls beneath the altar are crying out to God, how long yet, Lord, before you avenge our blood upon the wicked? How long yet before you rescue the rest of your church? And then the Heavenly Father, like a patient, patient parent to an impatient child, says, just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer, until, until your fellow believers have joined us. Then, that's how long. Then, can it be that someone in the church triumphant still carries affection for those in church triumph militant yes for certainly if a husband and wife have been married for 10 years 20 years 40 years 60 years and then he turns sick and gets weak and she tends him like a human angel 
waiting on him hand and foot. And then finally, amidst her tears, his soul is taken from his body and he is escorted heavenward, Lazarus style, on the wings of angels. Then certainly, she loves him the day after, just like she loved him the day before. And then certainly, certainly, he is not so cold-hearted as when he ascends into glory, he no longer cares about her and shuts her out like a cold shoulder would. That cannot be, is it? And those who have been in the battle and have fought the good fight, those even in a modern military who have, who have come through so much and maybe they've even been discharged with honor from the military because they have been wounded in battle and they have to come home to heal from their wounds, they still care about those buddies that are still fighting there in the midst of the conflict, of course. But be, please be aware when we read this, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. There are two traps you have to watch out for. And I witnessed both of these extremes that are totally wrong in the thinking of some of our people. There are some people who want to think that when we get to heaven, we're going to be so enthralled around about the throne of God that everybody of the other saints turns like into a nameless, faceless entity of a spirit somewhere there. Or as one man told me, and he considered himself a staunch Christian, When we get to heaven, we will be so enthralled around about the throne of God that we will be like a drop of the divine in the sea of the divine. And I sucked in my breath because he's quoting Hinduism. Wrong. 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 Love becomes complete in heaven, but it is love pure in heaven. At the same time, ignore that extreme, have nothing to do with it. There's another extreme that is very prevalent in the American church, and that is the extreme to trivialize heaven. As if when we get to bow around the throne, why, well, there's some people that can't even talk about the throne. There's some people that can't even talk about the Lord. They'll talk about meeting with grandpa and grandma and brother and sister and mom and dad and this, this one and that one and someone else as if they're having some eternal party up there in heaven. Is that right? No, wrong. In fact, don't even go there. Contrary to what some of our very devout brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church think, who make venerations and prayers to the saints, wrong, dead wrong. Or as the Russian Orthodox, I've seen some of those sanctuaries, some of those homes, or the Greek Orthodox, I've seen some of those homes too. An icon of a different saint in virtually every room because they're so reliant on the saints. Wrong! Or as some of those in the Eastern religions get involved in ancestor worship. Wrong! Instead, when you go to glory, when that moment comes, Christian, all your focus will be on the Lord. Your affections will remain. Your associations will remain. You will know faces and people. Witness Peter, James, and John automatically knew Elijah and John the Elijah and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's automatic because you, you're given a perfect mind, but it's totally pure up there. Nothing of human sin. And Jesus, what is Jesus doing now?
contrary to what some of those people think, they're not having a party in heaven. Absolutely not. Jesus says even, Matthew 26, verse 29, I will not eat of this supper, drink of this supper again, until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. In other words, Jesus is on the throne now. What is he doing? He's not partying. He's not eating and drinking. In fact, he is on a fasting diet. Century after century, year after year, day after day, moment after moment, he will not even eat because you are not yet there, Christian. When all the Christians are there, then that heavenly celebration shall begin. Meanwhile, you are being watched. And you are in the contest. Beautiful, isn't it? The way this comes out in the text. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. All of those Old Testament saints, all of the thousands and thousands and thousands of encouragement in Scripture. Let me make a quick confession to all of you who are children. I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad were both devout. But I failed to start reading my own Bible until I was 14 years old. From that point on, everything switched. Your faith has to be real. And then, from God's Word, He started speaking to my heart. And that transcends centuries of time as God speaks to you personally in the here and now. What a phenomenal privilege that is. Seeing we're surrounded by all these witnesses, those who have had their words inscripturated, those even of you who have Christian loved ones who give, have given you Christian guidance in the past, let those things, even if they're gone from planet Earth, let those encouragements still encourage you on the journey of life. And then, then what does it say? And let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily ensnares. You're in the center of the arena. You are in the contest. Get rid of anything that would hinder you, Christian. An athlete cannot run a marathon in a heavy winter coat. A construction man cannot win a race when he's trying to carry two huge two boxes full of tools. You cannot win if you've got three bags of garbage tied on your back. Therefore, lay aside every weight that hinders you or snares you. Lay aside every sin that might snag you or hinder your progress. Any? Wrong question. How many? But focus in. Do you have a tendency for envy? Be done with it. Jealousy? Quit. Gossip? Lay it aside. Hatred? Be done with it. Lust? Stop! Temper or tongue? Knock it off! If you had a huge tarantula climbing up your garment, complete with eight legs, two ugly eyes, and fangs filled with poison, you would knock it off. Any sin, Christian, knock it off. Why? Because you're running a race and you need to run with endurance. 
You need to run with endurance and all the while setting your face. Not on the saints gone before, absolutely not. Not on the crowd and the human beings around you, even those 80,000 plus Americans that might be looking at you. Don't look there. Focusing your eyes on Jesus. Because you want to please Him. Non-stop. And Jesus says to you, the contest is real. Jesus says to you, I know sometimes you will come through tough, tough, hideous stuff. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2 verse 10. And Jesus says to you, even now, I am in heaven preparing a place for you. That is your home. You're not at home yet. Back to the ceremony. Back to the Roman world. When two gladiators were going to fight, they're in the arena. They would walk out, standing there in the middle of the arena, think Colosseum. 87,000 people watching. And yet, before they began the fight, they would turn and face Caesar's booth. And if he was there, it was a real grand honor for them to fight in his presence. And then the gladiators together would go through this little ceremony. They would take their swords out, the sheath, kneel down on one knee, on one knee, put that sword tip onto the ground. And then they would look up at Caesar and say at the top of their voices, Hail Caesar, we the dying salute thee. And the fight would begin. You Christian, think of how favored you are. Because of Christ, he has taken your atonement. He has provided for that. He has taken your suffering. He has taken your sin. He has taken your death. He has even pre-laid in your casket. So you, Christian, you may get down on both knees and you may turn to that great throne and you may declare at the top of your voice or at the fulfillment of your praise O oh Christ, O oh King of kings and Lord of lords, my Redeemer, we, the living, salute Thee. Enough said. Let us pray. Lord, O King of kings and Lord of lords, how indebted we are to you, we shall not begin to comprehend until we are bowing before your throne among the saints in that phenomenal worship service and glory. Thank you, Lord, for this little worship service here. Thank you for each life here, and grant that every one of us might lay away aside any weight or sin that might entangle or hinder, and grant that each of us might give you all our praise with full hearts of love until we see you and the saints gone before and glory above. In Jesus' name, your name, O Redeemer, amen.